Over the last 6 months I've been playing through pretty much all of the LEGO TT games and whilst doing so I've been curating a bunch of cool facts about each of them. Now that I've finally finished all the LEGO games from my backlog I thought it could be fun to just compile all of these cool secrets, easter eggs and bits of behind the scenes trivia into one big video and that's this video that you're watching now. So I hope you enjoy, it's going to be quite a long one but if anybody ever asks you about LEGO games in the future I can guarantee you'll have something pretty cool to tell them. Like most people, whenever I hear someone mention LEGO games, I think of Star Wars because that's the first one I played back in the day. And after 19 years, I felt it high time to finish what I started and check out the rest of the mainline LEGO Star Wars games. And where better to start than with the game that hooked us all back in 2005 and kicked off this comfort food series of games that's still going strong to this day. LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga released back in 2007, and as I mentioned, it basically mashes together the first two LEGO Star Wars games made up of episodes 1 through 6. This game was universally praised at the time and for multiple different reasons, one of which being how much care and detail went into making these games feel true to the films but with LEGO's humour also mixed in. For example, in the Moss Eisley Cantina, which acts as the game's hub area, you'll no doubt have noticed the band playing this banger of a tune from the very first Star Wars film. However, if you head into the pause menu and turn off the music, the band will no longer play and then just stand around looking bewildered. This little attention to detail is such a cool fourth wall break which genuinely brought a smile to my face when I learned of it. There's also a reference to how Lando is always flirting with Leia in The Empire Strikes Back. So in these LEGO games you spend a lot of time running around and either punching, kicking or shooting the bejesus out of other minifigs until you dismember them. But here in LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga, if you play as Lando Calrissian and try to hit Princess Leia, you will actually take her hand and kiss it instead, mirroring one of the scenes from the film. It's a nice little reference, but this act of kindness doesn't extend to uh, every other woman in the game. For fans of the films, you'll remember the name Darth Plagueis, who is referenced in Episode 3 by Chancellor Palpatine. Well, Darth Plagueis was actually meant to be featured in LEGO Star Wars the video game as a playable character, as his name can be found deep within the files of the game. Up until this point, the developers likely didn't know what the character actually looked like, since he'd only been mentioned in passing. However, we can speculate he probably would have played similarly to Emperor Palpatine. Although Darth Plagueis never came to be, there are some lost characters which were uncovered within the game's files thanks to some clever computer folk online, meaning we can get a glimpse at some near completed characters. These characters didn't quite make it into the game for one reason or another, but one particularly interesting unused character is a Lego incarnation of Steve Sansweet, the real life owner of Rancho Obi-Wan, which is the largest museum collection of Star Wars memorabilia in the world. Another glimpse at what could have been comes in the form of this chase scene between Obi-Wan and General Grievous. One of the head developers stated that the sequence was cut because the team couldn't quite figure out how to make it work in multiplayer, which is an essential part of every level in TT LEGO games. It's a shame as thanks to one of the developers sharing this early build video, we can get a sense of how the chase would have played out, leading up to that climactic battle between Grievous and Kenobi. Now I'm actually still amazed that I didn't actually know about this when I played the complete saga all those years ago. But if you head over to the bonus trailers room, you'll find a trailer for LEGO Indiana Jones the video game, which at the time was TT Games' next entry in their LEGO series. I obviously didn't watch it as a young teen because I never knew that watching the trailer actually unlocks Indiana Jones as a playable character here in the game. This inclusion then kind of kicked off the whole cameo trend in TT LEGO games, as later entries would also feature characters from other games such as Star Wars characters being found in LEGO Indiana Jones, Indiana Jones being sighted on a poster in LEGO Batman, and a dinosaur from Jurassic Park being found in LEGO Batman 3. They're really cool additions which to this day encourage players to keep an eye out for who might crop up next, and made replaying this game all the more enjoyable for me after all these years. And so with that my nostalgia thirst was pretty much quenched, and so I moved on to the next LEGO Star Wars game which for one reason or another, I just skipped over when it released, despite the fact I absolutely loved the first two LEGO Star Wars games. LEGO Star Wars 3 came out back in 2011 based off the animated film Star Wars The Clone Wars and its follow up television series. I still haven't watched the film or the show to be honest, but I did enjoy the gameplay here in LEGO Star Wars 3. It felt like quite a significant upgrade to the previous LEGO Star Wars games. So to my understanding this game is based off the Clone Wars movie and the first two seasons of the show, but no further. I'm not sure why I've never watched them as I'm sure I'd enjoy them. Anyway here in LEGO Star Wars 3, there's actually a secret character you can unlock who doesn't even show up as a silhouette on the character roster so he could easily be missed. Usually secret characters are obtained by doing something in game or 100% completing it, but this character is unique in the fact that he's only obtainable via a cheat code. Head over to the cheat code input menu and stick in MELL07 and you'll unlock this guy. This is Savage Opress, I think that's how you pronounce his name who's the brother of the one and only Darth Maul. 
And what makes this interesting is that apparently he doesn't even show up in the Clone Wars TV show until season 3, so at the time this would have been a really cool secret for fans of the show to uncover. It got me thinking back to the days when cheat codes were in those gaming magazines I'd get every once in a while, and I was like, oh my god, I've hit gold, I wonder if anyone knows about this cheat code. Imagine if game companies did something similar nowadays. Hear me out on this one, imagine if they released a new LEGO game and in a social media post they just said, oh yeah by the way folks, there's 20 secret characters you can unlock in the game, but we've hidden the cheat codes to unlock them deep within the dark web. Happy hunting. Now that would be a risk worth taking. Up, down, triangle, triangle, square, circle. Ever since the very first Traveller's Tales LEGO game, there have been unused levels. Levels that for one reason or another just didn't make it into the final cut of the game, and here in LEGO Star Wars 3 there's actually quite a few. Thanks to a guy known as Roger Roger on YouTube who did some digging in the game's files, we're actually able to get a look into some of these unused levels. Most of them seem to be extensions of levels already seen in the final version of the game, but were perhaps cut for balancing reasons, and I know some levels in LEGO games drag on quite a bit, and would have benefited from being trimmed down a bit. And yes, I'm looking at you, The Force Awakens. Most of these unused levels aren't fully finished, of course, and like I said, I'm not very familiar with the source material for this game, so a lot of the names and locations are a bit lost on me. There are, however, a couple which I did find pretty cool, like this alternate hub area which was never seen in the final game, or this contraption here which potentially could have allowed players to build their very own General Grievous. And if you want to look at more of these levels, I'd recommend checking out this video by Bombastic, who does a really good deep dive into those lost levels. Look here, it's every possible button and lever you can press and pull in the game. This game came out back in the days where LEGO games were very much centred around slapstick comedy, emphasised by the characters mumbling and making over the top noises. Now I presumed here in LEGO Star Wars 3 the noises were done by an in-house team of voiceover artists or something, but they actually brought in the cast from the Clone Wars film and series to do the mumbling and other sounds for their respective characters such as Ashley Eckstein as Ahsoka. You feel like you're going back into the show and the spirit of the characters, it crosses over from the show to the game. And Matt Lanter as Anakin. You hear us every week on, on the Clone Wars. Um, and you get to know these voices, and you get to know these characters with this voice. And it's going to be fun for fans of Star Wars and fans of the Clone Wars to actually hear the real cast. This genuinely surprised me, as surely it would have been cheaper to just hire general voiceover artists to do the sounds, as they literally don't say a word in the game, but knowing that those sounds were made by the actual cast is such a pleasant surprise and attention to detail that is appreciated. I bet it was so fun for people to go into the studio and do those noises for the LEGO games. I'd actually love to give it a go myself. I definitely wouldn't call myself a voice actor like, but I can do this one noise that could be used for like, a weird alien or something. I don't know how or why I can do this, but here goes. <laughs> I think it's safe to say LEGO Star Wars 3 maybe didn't have the broadest appeal when it first released, but as it ages, I think this will be fondly remembered as one of those LEGO games that really stepped things up a gear and experimented a bit with the formula, which is always a good thing in my eyes. The next game on this LEGO Star Wars Odyssey is one which kind of surprised me with its existence to be honest, but I can't deny for a game which feels a little unnecessary, I had a surprisingly good time with it. LEGO Star Wars The Force Awakens came out back in 2016, being a tie-in game for Episode 7, which I thought was a fairly decent film, all things considered. A little safe, but still a worthwhile watch. Unlike most other TT LEGO games, this only really covers one film, so as expected, the levels feel a little stretched, like... Butter scraped over too much bread. This did, however, give the developers ample opportunity to get creative and throw in nods to the Star Wars universe, with a handful here that I thought were worth mentioning. First off, if you take a wander around the Jakku level and head toward the top of the map, you may need to zoom in a little to see it, but you can just about make out a poster on the wall. This poster is actually from LEGO Star Wars The Original Trilogy, where the developers took a comedic jab at the classic 1977 Star Wars poster which features the most muscular version of Luke Skywalker I have ever seen. Where was this hunk of a man in Star Wars? Everyone would have been saved if he was in the film. This poster isn't the only inclusion poking a bit of fun at the original cast of Star Wars however. At some point during the story, we find Han Solo and Chewie trying to escape a ship and Han narrowly escapes through a closing blast door. Whilst doing so, he manages to drop his hairpiece, but just about grabs it in time, which is a brilliant little play on the classic hat-grabbing scene from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, since Harrison Ford plays both Han Solo and Indiana Jones. 
Although the guy is getting on in years, in my opinion he did a great job in the most recent Star Wars films, and in particular Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. He's just likeable, I don't know. And finally here in LEGO Star Wars The Force Awakens, you can actually play as the film's director J.J. Abrams and producer Kathleen Kennedy, which is pretty cool. They can even be found on Jakku, recreating a film set, but for some reason George Lucas isn't included in the game. You know the guy who created the very first Star Wars film? You know that guy? So this game, like LEGO Star Wars 3, made a few tweaks to the LEGO formula. It added in some gallery type shooting sections, and the option to choose what you build with the LEGO bricks scattered across the floor. It kind of felt like they were trying to make up for the fact the game is only covering one film. So these things feel a little like padding for the sake of the game's length, which is fair enough, but I did find it cool that pretty much the entire cast from the film reprised their roles here in LEGO Star Wars The Force Awakens. You've got Harrison Ford coming back as Han Solo. Let me check. Make sure there isn't anything dangerous in her. Carrie Fisher playing Leia. The main computers through those blast doors. Adam Driver as Kylo Ren. I can feel the darkness. And Daisy Ridley as Rey, to name but a few. Oh, I hate stormtroopers. It really was a pleasant surprise hearing these voices during gameplay. They've done this with a few of these LEGO games now, which just adds that extra level of authenticity. And if you view this as a standalone movie tie-in game, then it's actually a pretty damn good one. I was noticing an absence in unique alien noises though. Perhaps if they make another LEGO Star Wars game, they can introduce some more diverse aliens that make sounds like, um... <laughs> So as you're collecting all the characters here in LEGO Star Wars The Force Awakens, you'll come across this astromech droid called R2KT, which I didn't recall seeing in any Star Wars films or games, but it turns out that this droid has a very special place within the Star Wars universe. It's named after Katie Johnson, who was the daughter of Albin Johnson, the founder of the 501st Legion Costuming Group. When Katie was diagnosed with terminal cancer, Albin and the R2-D2 Builders Club created a pink astromech droid named R2KT, which remained by her bedside the entire time. This story reached the ears of higher-ups, and the droid was then adopted into Star Wars continuity after Katie's death. This makes this droid's inclusion here in LEGO Star Wars The Force Awakens very special and pretty heartwarming to be honest. Good on TT Games for featuring this in the game, and what a hero Katie's dad is. It really did bring a smile to my face when I read about this. And on that bittersweet note, it was time to play the most recent LEGO Star Wars game, and my god is this a big one. I've not attempted to 100% complete this game just yet, as I probably only have 50 odd years left on this planet Earth, and I'm not sure that's enough time to tackle this behemoth of a game. The LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga came out back in 2022, and safe to say it stuck the landing. It was praised across the board for being the most expansive and immersive LEGO game to date, not to mention being pretty damn hilarious. You guys! You guys are the best! I never thought I'd make it to retirement, but here I am! I absolutely loved playing through this game, and yes, it's very different to the original LEGO Star Wars game, which came out all those years ago, but I'm personally glad TT Games continue to evolve and experiment with their games, and it paid off for them big time here. Although this truly felt like a fresh entry from TT Games, it still featured their signature charm and style, along with an absolute plethora of new easter eggs to spot, one of which references Star Wars movies that I didn't even know existed. So at some point whilst you're exploring the galaxy, you may find yourself on Endor, and if you take up the quest to Courageous Cache, you'll be required to solve a puzzle featuring a painting. Before doing so, if you speak to this Ewok next to it, they'll mention how this is actually a painting of a family who was stranded here on Endor. Well it turns out this is actually a reference to the Tawani family who appeared in the Ewok Adventure and the Ewok's Battle for Endor, two Star Wars TV movies from the 1980s which I'm now going to hunt down and watch. There's also a brilliant reference to a classic scene from the 1960 film Spartacus, where an army commander tells the rebel slaves that they can live as long as they give up Spartacus. To mask the identity of the real Spartacus, the other slaves do this. I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! This scene is then comically recreated here in LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga, where the real Queen Amidala tries to make herself known to the Gungan ruler Rugor Nass. I am Queen Amidala. No. I am Queen Amidala. I am Queen Amidala. No. I am Queen Amidala. Queen Amidala. While we're here, can we just appreciate how cool Jawas are in Star Wars? To top it all off, the developers threw in some nice little nods to the earlier LEGO Star Wars games by including throwbacks to older easter eggs. For example, there's the dancing chairs from the very first LEGO Star Wars video game, and there's these beach troopers just chilling in a hot tub which featured in LEGO Star Wars 2 the original trilogy. 
You can also find physical copies of the previous LEGO Star Wars games scattered throughout the galaxy, such as the first LEGO Star Wars game found here at the water's edge on Naboo, the second game on Tantive 4 hidden on one of the upper levels, and The Force Awakens can be found down in the catacombs of Mazzy's castle. Oh, and the devs placed a literal easter egg here on Hoth. Very on the nose, and I appreciate that. But yeah, these are just a few I personally liked, and there's plenty more hidden details to be found for eagle-eyed folk, so feel free to check out the comments section of this video, as I'm sure others have mentioned a good few more. So as many fans know, the LEGO games have evolved a lot over the years, and one substantial change was the shift from characters mumbling and making barely any noise, to characters now being fully voice acted. I think depending on if you grew up with these games or not, some people preferred the mumbling as it gave the games that extra unique characteristic which was absent in later games. However, LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga was the first of the LEGO games to allow players to choose for themselves how they want to experience the story. You can either have the characters mumble like this, or you can have them fully voice acted. You underestimate Skywalker and Ben Solo. Uh -huh. It's an appreciated touch from the devs to try and cater to both new and long-standing fans of these games. I tried a bit of both on my playthrough, and I've got to say the voice acting is done so well that even I preferred it over the classic mumbling. And that's because the game features high caliber voice acting from a range of returning voiceover artists who have worked on previous Star Wars animated shows and games, plus some original actors from the mainline films, such as Anthony Daniels as C-3PO and Billy D. Williams as Lando Calrissian. When researching the cast though, I found out this funny little bit of trivia about Princess Leia. So during the first half of the very first Star Wars film, Princess Leia speaks with an English accent, but for some reason she then shifts to an American accent in the second half. The more you tighten your grip, Tarkin, the more star systems will slip through your fingers. Will somebody get this big walking carpet out of my way? I personally have never noticed this, but I will definitely keep an eye out for it next time I watch it. But yeah, the voice actress Shelby Young, who voiced Leia here in LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga, purposely recreated this funny little accent shift to play the character as authentically as possible. I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic mission to Alderaan. Aren't you a little short for a stormtrooper? It makes me wonder how often this happens in films, like the actor's accent changes or their hair is a different length from scene to scene or something and we just don't even notice. Keep an eye out for it next time you're watching something. Maybe it ha happens more often than we realise. Wait, what? Now the developers over at TT Games have pretty much stuck to their tried and true formula for LEGO games since 2005, with a few tweaks and experiments along the way such as LEGO Worlds being a sandbox game instead of being level based. However, LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga marked a big behind the scenes change as this was the first LEGO game to be made using the new NTT engine. It was custom built and developed specifically for LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga which is why the game stands out so much compared to other TT LEGO games. Also, unlike most LEGO games which feature solid structures as well as LEGO brick constructions, most of what is visible in LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga is just made out of LEGO bricks. For example, the Star Destroyer's design was made out of around 18 million pieces and wasn't based on an existing physical LEGO set. According to the game director James McLaughlin, every spaceship interior is made entirely out of bricks, including the Death Star, which is extremely impressive when you explore some of these environments. However, this impressive changeup came at a cost, as the NTT engine turned out to be pretty difficult for developers to use, with some animations taking much longer to produce than they would have on the old engine. Because of this, the Skywalker Saga would end up being the only game developed by Traveller's Tales to use the NTT engine, with the studio deciding to use Unreal Engine going forward for their future projects. In my very humble opinion, these games have always looked great from a graphical and artistic standpoint, like they've never missed a beat, so as long as the style and charm remains present, TT Games will hopefully continue to make and evolve these games in whichever way works best for them. And with that, I'm all caught up on the mainline LEGO Star Wars games. All in all, I had a great time with each of them. They all have some features which make them distinct from one another, and it's kind of a series that I can imagine will always do well since the very first LEGO Star Wars game holds so many good memories for a lot of folk. And if TT Games continue to make them to the same standard as the Skywalker saga, the future's looking pretty good for LEGO Star Wars games. And now for something completely different. LEGO Indiana Jones The Original Adventures released back in 2008, however the game was earlier marketed simply as LEGO Indiana Jones The Video Game, similar to LEGO Star Wars The Video Game before it. This was likely changed due to the fourth film coming out around that time, and this game only featured the first three films. Whilst exploring one of the earlier levels of the game called City of Danger, there's a side room with a bunch of satellite dishes inside. If you look closely at this support post right here, you'll find a small Polaroid picture of a dog. This is an Alaskan Malamute, and the dog belonged to George Lucas who created, produced and co-wrote the first four Indiana Jones films. 
If you've seen the films, you'll know that they feature Nazis quite prominently. However, developers TT Games decided to remove any reference of Nazis when making the LEGO Indiana Jones game. Instead, they replaced them with the uh, <clears throat> anonymous genocidal occult trench coat wearing master race. Much better. In one of the opening levels of the game, you're introduced to Indiana Jones as he's teaching in his university lecture room. The shot features him writing something on the chalkboard, but if we freeze it right here, this bunch of letters and numbers reading OP1 TA5 or OP1 to 5 is actually a cheat code for the game. You can head over to the room in the university where you input cheats, stick this code in and unlock the super slap ability. The music in these films is iconic and it's only right that TT Games featured it in their LEGO game, however they also featured some music from the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. The TV show ran from 1992 to 1993, exploring the childhood, adolescence and early adulthood of the fictional character. Junior! Junior! <laughs> and Harrison Ford even featured in one of the episodes to bookend it. A big part of LEGO Indiana Jones is collecting minikits. There's 10 in each level which make up an artifact, and that artifact is then displayed back at the university hub world. They're nice to look at, for sure, but what the game doesn't tell you is that if you hold down the action button when interacting with an artifact, you can watch it disassemble and reassemble itself in front of your very eyes. You may have noticed all the studs and hearts raining everywhere throughout this video. That's because when you 100% the game, the sky opens in the university hub world, and you're absolutely drenched in studs and hearts which are both useless at this point, and frankly, anxiety inducing to look at. And now for something completely different. The developers over at Traveller's Tales have been making LEGO games for about 20 plus years at this point. A fair few of their most popular ones are based on DC Comics. There's three based on the iconic Dark Knight, making up the LEGO Batman trilogy, and then they mix things up a bit with LEGO DC Supervillains, which I thought was a bit of a bold pivot, but turns out the game was a lot better than I expected. And where better to start than with the very first game from 2008, simply titled LEGO Batman The Video Game. Now I didn't play this game when it first came out, as I was more of a Star Wars and Indiana Jones kind of guy. I'm glad I finally gave it a go though, and it turns out that regardless of which LEGO game I'm playing, I can't help but smile at the attention to detail and subtle nods to pop culture that's hidden in these games. For example, there's a level here in LEGO Batman called The Joker's Masterpiece, where you run through an art gallery as the classic villains Scarecrow and the Joker. Whilst checking out some of the art on display though, you may notice this one here. It's quite a standout to be honest, which makes sense because this is actually a LEGO recreation of a very famous painting by Rembrandt called The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp. It's kind of funny that LEGO featured this in the game since the original is pretty graphic, but there is a more family friendly easter egg here also worth mentioning. Whilst exploring the villains level called An Enterprising Theft, if you head over to this room here and smash some stuff up, you'll then be able to build and ride this robotic dog. It's pretty cool in and of itself, but this dog is actually called K9 and is taken straight from the classic science fiction show Doctor Who. The kill black and cloning technique replicates from the single cell as a short-lived carbon copy efficacy of individuation not completely guaranteed. Can you explain simply? This was only the beginning for easter eggs and secrets in LEGO DC games however, as plenty more would crop up in later games too, encouraging players to constantly keep an eye out for them. So Batman is of course a very well known character, and there's plenty of adventures out there featuring the Cape Crusader, which made it all the more interesting that TT Games actually decided to create an original story for this game instead of recreating a well established one, similar to their previous games Lego Star Wars and Indiana Jones. Although original, a lot of inspiration was drawn from the 80s and 90s films, most notably the environments and set designs such as the snowman statue outside of Mr Freeze's in-game hideout being the very same snowman statue portrayed in the Batman and Robin film. The game's soundtrack also consists of rearranged music from the 1989 Batman film, for example the intro music for the game is Danny Elfman's score from the film. Some connections to Batman media go as far back as the 1966 Batman movie. The three main villains in that movie are the Riddler, Penguin and the Joker, and it just so happens that they are all villains here in LEGO Batman the video game, each with their own chapters. It could be a coincidence, but with such a large villain roster to choose from, I think TT Games knew what they were doing, but still delivered a story that felt very much their own. So this here is Tropical Joker, an unlockable outfit here in the game. To a casual player such as myself, this appeared to just be a fun inclusion thrown in by the devs, but it turns out this is very reminiscent of Joker's outfit from The Killing Joke, a one-shot graphic novel set within the Batman universe. The Killing Joke provides an origin story for the supervillain Joker, with him wearing this tourist getup as a bit of a gag whilst he takes some pictures of a, let's say, not-so-family-friendly encounter with Barbara Gordon. 
This makes the inclusion of this outfit in the game both cool and kind of dark, as the outfit is very symbolic for Batman fans who know the story behind it, but yet innocent looking to those unaware. There's actually another pretty graphic reference to the Batman comics here in LEGO Batman. So this is a pretty memorable scene from the 2012 film The Dark Knight Rises, where Bane essentially shatters Batman's back. Well it turns out this is based off a very iconic moment in the comics. Batman's backbreak first took place in the Nightfall arc of DC Comics Batman back in 1993, and there just so happens to be a bit of a hidden reference to it in LEGO Batman the video game. In free play, if you play as Bane and start attacking certain characters, you'll eventually trigger an animation where Bane proceeds to pick them up and full on break their spine, followed by them exploding with guts everywhere. And then he paints his face with your blood and then he sucks the bone marrow out and... But yeah, the team behind LEGO Batman the video game did a great job at making the game feel welcoming to newcomers, whilst also throwing in nods for veteran Batman fans to enjoy. And with that, we move on to arguably one of the most evolutionary LEGO games of the bunch. LEGO Batman 2 came out back in 2012. I absolutely loved the Batman Arkham games, and I also enjoyed the Dark Knight films. But beyond that, I wouldn't say I'm well versed in the DC universe. That being said, I had a surprisingly good time with LEGO Batman 2. This was the first LEGO game to feature spoken dialogue. Okay, that isn't technically correct, as LEGO Island from all the way back in 1997 was actually the first. No pepper, no papa, no pepper, no papa, no pizza, no pizza, no pepper, no- But LEGO Batman 2 was the first LEGO TT game to have the characters fully voice acted. I'm not sure if there's an official word from the developers out there, but most folk believe that they chose to introduce dialogue to help get the story across. The LEGO Batman games have original stories written by TT Games, so having the characters speak ensured they could more freely tell the tale they wanted to, whereas most of their other games are parodies of films, so it was kind of expected that the player would already know the story. I personally loved that they decided to do this, as it helped add a bit of variety to the humour found in these games. Granted, LEGO Batman 2 isn't the funniest LEGO game since they were still testing the waters at the time, but it set the stage for later LEGO games to freely riff off the source material beyond physical comedy and mumbling. Either you guys know the scar of the game? I don't follow sports. This paved the way for games such as LEGO City Undercover, which many, including myself, class as one of their funniest games. Oh, it's a good thing I don't have vertigo or some other ridiculous phobia. It seems Traveller's Tales have a handful of movies they can't help but reference in their games, and one of those films is Back to the Future. During free play here in LEGO Batman 2, if you head over to this clock in the level The Next President, you'll be able to use a magnetic character to force the clock to read 4 minutes past 10. Once you do, it'll cause a lightning strike just above the clock, with the whole thing then exploding, rewarding you with a mini kit. Now I wouldn't have thought anything of this, but it turns out this is a pretty close recreation of a scene from Back to the Future, wherein Marty and the Doctor cause something pretty much identical to happen. This reference is so accurate in fact that even the time on both of the clocks reads the same. I'll be honest, like I mentioned in the previous video, I've not actually watched this film, so I'm not sure what's happening in the scene, but I would presume they're going back to the future. It is on the backlog to watch, and I'm pretty sure I'll enjoy it once I get around to watching it. Or I could just ask my future self if it's any good, since he's already seen it. What did you think of Back to the Future? Uh, yeah, it was really good. Enjoyed it. Oh, nice. Did you watch the sequels as well? No, not yet. Not got around to it. So one of the main draws of the LEGO games is the fact they're big collectathons. Chances are that a lot of the folks who enjoy these games do so because they enjoy collecting all the characters and mini kits, etc. It's genuinely relaxing to just stick something on in the background and slowly work towards collecting everything in the game, and LEGO Batman 2 was the first to introduce a truly open world, making the whole collecting process even more enjoyable. Games prior to this had smallish hub worlds, with the collecting being done within the story levels, but in this game you're able to freely explore Gotham City and collect things hidden in every corner of the map. This also gives you the chance to meet characters you never would have otherwise if you just played the main story. Mad me? Oh, very well then! These open worlds were then a staple of the TT LEGO games going forward, and we have LEGO Batman 2 to thank for it. It makes up for such a big part of the games now. I mean, look at LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga for example, which has an entire open galaxy to explore. It's a joy to just run, drive, and fly around as your favourite characters and experiment with ones you wouldn't have otherwise played as. A bonus little fact is that when you fly around as Superman here in LEGO Batman 2's open world, John Williams' iconic theme song will play from the 1978 Superman film. That guy composed the music for Star Wars, Jurassic Park, Indiana Jones, Harry Potter, 
And only now have I found out that he also composed the Superman theme song. I'm starting to doubt if there's anything that man can't do. Speaking of movies, Batman has had a fair few in his time. Some of them are brilliant, and some of them are great if you watch it on mute with a blindfold. Hi Freeze, I'm Batman. Batman my ass, I'm more Batman than him. As you would expect, Lego Batman 2 makes a good few references to some of these films. I won't list all of them here, but there are a couple I wanted to highlight. Firstly, there's this play on the wise words given by Rush Al Ghul in Batman Begins. If you make yourself more than just a man, then you become something else entirely. If you make yourself more than just a man, you become a Superman. No, that's not right. And secondly, this scene here, which is a fun little nod to the wonderfully ridiculous scene from the 1966 Batman movie, where he fights off a shark with his shark repellent bat spray. Holy sardine! That portrayal of Batman was played by the one and only Adam West, and I remember watching this Batman TV series when I was growing up, and just loved how wacky it was. You can imagine then how happy I was when I got around to playing the third entry in the LEGO DC series, as Adam West has a pretty substantial presence in the game. LEGO Batman 3 Beyond Gotham was released back in 2014 and rounds off the LEGO Batman trilogy but simultaneously opened the DC floodgates for a whole array of characters to take centre stage. At times it kind of felt like the game's focus on Batman was a little lost, as there's just so many characters who get screen time, which isn't a bad thing, I guess, but when you want a Batman game, you want a Batman game. Thankfully though, Adam West's version of the Cape Crusader makes his presence felt throughout the game in a few different ways. Now I'm pretty sure most people have heard this iconic Batman theme at some point in their life. Well this originates from Adam West's 1966 Batman series, and here in LEGO Batman 3, if you head over to the character select screen and highlight particular characters, something very cool happens. You'll hear them sing their own version of this classic tune. Wonder Woman! me! This on its own is a clever little throwback, but then there's the fact Adam West is also the character in peril here in the game, where you have to find and save him in every level. And there's even a bonus mission dedicated to the classic TV series, with Adam West himself narrating it. We join our heroes in the top secret Batcave as they prepare to tackle the Joker's evil schemes. But something is curiously amiss. I'm personally really glad that TT Games decided to pay homage to a show that myself and many others watched growing up, and I mean, even if you're not a Batman fan, that theme song is just infectious. As with the previous LEGO Batman games, this one has a good few pop culture references, for example, TT Games' next project LEGO Jurassic World being teased at the very end of the game. There's a few other nods to things, both within and outside of the DC Universe. A pretty obvious one crops up whilst you're wandering around the Batcave, as like you'd expect you eventually come across the Batmobile, but this version is actually the one from Batman Arkham Knight, a game which wasn't actually released until a few months after LEGO Batman 3. This was then a cool little tease at the upcoming game, supported by the inclusion of a Riddler trophy appearing behind a cracked wall in the Batcave trophy room. Looking at easter eggs outside of the DC Universe, we get a couple more references to the Doctor Who show like I mentioned at the beginning. One such being this TARDIS appearing in a cave on the level Space Suits You Sir, and another which is a bit more sinister. Those horrifying weeping angels from the show can be found lurking throughout this game, for example just here outside the Hall of Doom. This one's particularly cool because if you pan the camera away from them, they'll eerily have changed position when you look back, mirroring what happens in the show. I have a vivid memory of me and my sister watching the very first episode of Doctor Who which featured these weeping angels when we were younger and it still haunts me to this day. Now here's a character who isn't technically in the DC Universe, but is an unlockable character here in LEGO Batman 3. This is the Fierce Flame, and she is an original character created by the winner of a competition set up by TT Games as the game was being developed. Participants would have to create a superhero by designing their physical appearance, then choose from a pool of character traits, and finally name them. The winner received a framed image of their character signed by the game developers, and also got a free copy of the game so they could see their own minifig creation come to life, and the Fierce Flame was the winner. Her inclusion in the game must be pretty special for whoever created her. Not sure if she's meant to be a hero or a villain like, but TT Games decided to go in an interesting direction with their next LEGO DC game by focusing pretty much entirely on the villains of the DC Universe. 
LEGO DC Super Villains released in 2018 and is the most recent entry in the LEGO DC series. As I mentioned, it focuses pretty much solely on the villains found in the DC Universe, and in my opinion the gamble paid off. The game actually coincided with the 10 year anniversary of LEGO Batman the video game, and the whole concept for it stemmed from the villains campaign found within that one, which kind of spiritually links these two games together quite nicely. This was the first time TT Games made a LEGO game based on villains, and they didn't just flip a Batman story on its head and call it a day. The game has a fleshed out and worthwhile narrative that lives up to its namesake. This was also the very first TT LEGO game to incorporate a custom character into the main story. Yes, you could make your own character in pretty much all the previous LEGO games, but in this one, your character was actually part of the adventure and features in cutscenes alongside DC characters. It's cool to see them interact and the customizer allows you to truly make the villain you want. I kind of obsessed over it at times, as do many people when making a custom character. I think I got it pretty spot on though, to be honest. That's me, right? That is me. So by this point, voice acting, which was first introduced in LEGO Batman 2, became the norm for TT LEGO games. The team really went above and beyond in making these minifigs feel like authentic versions of the actual characters by bringing in only the greatest of voice actors. I'd have to be crazy to say no to that offer. Unless you're just one of the voices in my head, in which case, I'm crazy anyway! And LEGO DC Super Villains was no different. The game features actors who worked on the animated Justice League series, and even the Batman Arkham games, but there's one character in particular who had a switch up from previous LEGO DC games. One of the most well-known portrayals of Joker is performed by Mark Hamill. There's a teeny little bit of me in you too, bats! AKA Luke Skywalker, AKA one of the coolest nerds on Earth. Now to get this guy on board to voice Joker is a pretty big achievement, but TT Games managed it with LEGO DC Supervillains. In order to keep it as a surprise for fans, Christopher Corey Smith, who voiced the Joker in LEGO Batman 2 and 3, provided the voice of the character in the game's announcement trailer, until Mark Hamill's voice was later revealed at E3 in 2018. As you can imagine, most folk were very pleased with this, as he brings such menacing and unpredictable yet comedic qualities to the Joker's character, making him particularly enjoyable to play as here in LEGO DC Supervillains. For a game which focuses on supervillains, there's actually a pretty touching aspect behind the development of this game. When you've completed the game and the credits roll, you'll eventually come to an opening in space, followed by this message. This game is dedicated to a baby girl called Poppy Elsie Keeling, who unfortunately died of a rare disease before the game was released. She was the daughter of Sean Keeling, a cinematics animator who worked on the game, and TT Games decided it would be fitting to dedicate this game to his daughter's memory. You'll probably have noticed the space rocket flying around in the background too, which actually has a little minifig version of Poppy controlling it. As to my understanding, her nickname was Rocket. It's a bittersweet yet touching inclusion that I just felt was worth mentioning, and Poppy will now forever live on in the ever-expanding LEGO universe. And with that, I'm all caught up on the LEGO DC games. As far as I'm aware, there's no talks of a new game anytime soon, but even though I'm not the biggest DC fan, you can be sure I'll be diving in to check out any new entries later down the line. And now for something completely different. This guy here is Harry Potter, the boy who lived and went on to become one of the most well-known names in the world. It made sense then when the video game LEGO Harry Potter Years 1-4 to was released, folks absolutely loved it, but it turns out, to my surprise anyway, this wasn't actually the first LEGO Harry Potter video game. Back in 2001, a game called LEGO Creator Harry Potter released, where players explored four different areas based on Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, being Diagon Alley, King's Cross Station, Hogwarts Grounds and the inside of Hogwarts itself. In each of these worlds, players were able to use LEGO models and minifigures to customise the worlds however they wanted. What I found really cool was the fact that these models were all based on the Harry Potter Lego sets that were being sold at the time. This game is special for a couple of reasons. Number one, this was the very first Lego video game based on a licensed property, and number two, it was the very first Harry Potter video game as it came out on October 21st, 2001, a few weeks before the movie tie-in game and even the film itself. Go home to your mother, Potter. Oh, sorry, you don't have one, do you? It still amazes me that back in the early 2000s it was common that movie tie-in games were released before the films, and featured actual scenes from the films sometimes. Jumping forward to 2010, this is when developers TT Games had a crack at LEGO Harry Potter with their first game, Years 1-4, to and by this point they had a few LEGO games under their belt. They'd covered Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Batman, and in all of these previous games they would throw in little nods to their past games for players to spot. Continuing on this tradition, whilst playing through Year 3 based on the Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry, Ron and Hermione find themselves in Hagrid's hut just before Hagrid's beloved hippogriff Buckbeak is beheaded. At some point, they start getting bombarded with objects through the window, and as they look outside to see who it was, we see this guy come into view. It's a scarecrow, but this is THE scarecrow. 
the infamous villain from the Batman universe. This is a really cool nod to the developer's previous game Lego Batman the video game, and if we zoom in even closer you can just about make out Oscar winning Irish actor Killian Murphy. He played Scarecrow in Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight trilogy, but also I found out recently that Cork Airport in Ireland is going to be named after Killian Murphy. Pretty cool. By 2010, the gameplay formula for these TT LEGO games was pretty well established. Players relive all the key moments from the licensed property, but comically and charmingly recreated in LEGO form. Attention to detail is a certainty. You can tell the developers understand and care about crafting funny yet faithful video game adaptations for any fan to enjoy. One of the most iconic parts of JK Rowling's Wizarding World is broomstick riding acting as a fair few witches and wizards mode of transport throughout the books and films. They come in handy at multiple points throughout the saga, but Harry is without doubt the best flyer we see on screen. This translates over into the TT LEGO Harry Potter games, as Harry is pretty much the only one who can fly a broom well and use spells while doing so. Most of the main characters in the game either can't fly very well or at all. Hermione is the best example, as in the film she actively shows her discomfort whilst flying on Buck Beak after Harry and Hermione set him free, and here in LEGO Harry Potter, she basically can't fly in a straight line and is borderline uncontrollable for the player. Although she can't fly, she can do things that Ron and Harry can't, like use spellbooks to tackle certain puzzles. These are really cool details which just show how much care goes into making these LEGO games, not just this one, but all of them. When TT Games first started to release these LEGO games, they very much leaned into the more visual slapstick style of comedy. This was mainly due to the fact they didn't feature any dialogue, so the humour mostly came from characters visually overreacting to things while spurting gibberish. Hmm? This changed when LEGO Batman 2 DC Superheroes came along, because this marked the beginning of TT Games using fully voice acted dialogue in their games. Well, Batman! Any last words? Yeah. Look. This meant that LEGO Harry Potter Years 5-7 was the last TT LEGO game to have characters speaking purely in gibberish, and for some, marked the end of the classic LEGO games. I kinda see where people are coming from, the gibberish used in these earlier games was definitely one of their defining pillars and contribute to their appeal. But I don't personally mind the dialogue in the LEGO games following LEGO Harry Potter. The story in LEGO Batman 2 for example was actually really good, like a genuinely good DC story, which wouldn't have worked half as well if it had been restricted to using gibberish. It seems that TT Games listened to fans though, as they featured a gibberish mode many years later when they released LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga, giving fans the option to choose between this <sighs> And this. Obi-Wan, promise. Promise me you will train the boy. Yes, master. In pretty much every video game nowadays, you have unlockable achievements. Trophies and gamer score to look back on when you've overcome a challenge. Sometimes these achievements are there purely for a bit of fun, and Lego Harry Potter came up with a brilliant one. In years 1 to 4 on the console version of the game, there's an achievement called Solid Snape, which requires the player to hide inside a barrel whilst playing as Professor Snape. Seems simple enough, and it is, as this isn't so much a challenge but rather in true LEGO style, this is a funny little reference to the incredibly popular Metal Gear games. In the Metal Gear Solid games, you play as a character called Solid Snake, a world class spy. Most of the time he's infiltrating somewhere or having to outsmart an adversary, but one of the methods in which he remains hidden from enemies is, bearing in mind he's a world class spy, he hides in a drum can or barrel of some kind and sneaks around like something out of fucking Looney Tunes. I can't fault it I guess, it obviously works, but this is exactly what LEGO Harry Potter is referencing with its Solid Snape achievement. If the developers added in a death scene similar to the one found in Metal Gear Solid, that would have just been the absolute icing on the cake. Snake, answer me! Snake! Snake! Speaking of achievements, there's one here in LEGO Harry Potter attached to quite a unique spell in the Wizarding World. In years 1-4, to four, if you head over to this shop in Diagon Alley, you can buy various bonus spells which aren't taught in school and are non-essential to finishing the game. They're pretty much all there just for a bit of fun, but among the spells is this one, the Freezing Charm Glacius, or Glacius, depending on where you're from. When you have it unlocked, if you proceed to freeze 20 characters wandering about the game, then you'll unlock the Chilled Out achievement. Essentially it's just a freezing charm which can trap a person in a solid block of ice. A fairly common spell found in many fantasy universes, however it is unique in the Wizarding World due to it being a spell which wasn't actually featured in the books. It first appeared in the movie tie-in game for Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, and has been used in pretty much every Harry Potter game since. But during lessons in LEGO Harry Potter, if you wind up some of the professors enough, they will eventually cast Glacius onto you, freezing you in place for being a little prick. 
I remember seeing this for the first time whilst playing and thought it was a cool little feature, but it's even cooler to know that that spell originated in a Harry Potter game rather than the books. When you think of Lego, you likely think of building stuff, which makes sense. For those who haven't played the earlier Lego games, you may be surprised to know that TT Games actually featured a level editor in two of their games, the first being Lego Indiana Jones 2 and the second being Lego Harry Potter. The latter would unfortunately be the last time TT Games featured a level editor in their Lego games. I'm not too sure why, but if I had to guess, I suppose the level editor maybe wasn't a big hit with fans. Perhaps it took too long to develop for a feature that not too many people used. Now if they added a feature where you could share levels online akin to games like Little Big Planet, I think people would really enjoy that. With the explosive success of Minecraft and survival games over the last decade, I'm sure there's a huge amount of people now who would love to create their own LEGO levels and share them online for folks to check out. People could make speedrun challenge levels, party games, or maybe even, I don't know, just throwing ideas out there. The final film from the Hobbit trilogy that we never got to play? But yeah, LEGO Harry Potter marked the last time a level editor was featured in a TT LEGO game. So it's pretty clear Harry Potter is a huge franchise, and LEGO Harry Potter is doing very well in terms of sales when it comes to the physical sets. This wasn't always the case though, as for three years between 2007 and 2010, LEGO didn't release any new Harry Potter themed sets. Many fans at the time believed they might not see another LEGO Harry Potter set, until 2010 swung around and a special Potter themed LEGO line covering years 1-7 to was released. Developers TT Games announced that a LEGO Harry Potter video game would be released that very same year, which was when the world was treated to LEGO Harry Potter years 1-4. to The game received mostly positive reviews from across the board, as folks loved the soundtrack and faithfulness to the source material, whilst being impressed with the graphics for the time. The game did well enough to have a knock-on effect and helped boost the sales of the newly released LEGO Harry Potter sets by quite a bit. For many then, this game breathed new life into Harry Potter as a whole, and no doubt contributed to it now being one of LEGO's most popular licensed properties. And now for something completely different. LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean released back in 2011, and around the same time the physical LEGO sets were released. This was nothing particularly new as LEGO had done this kind of thing with Harry Potter for example, but what made these sets a bit more special is the fact they all contained a poster inside, and on that poster was a code. If you took that code and put it into your computer, it would launch every single nuclear missile, nah I'm only kidding, it's actually a cheat code for the video game. If you head over to the pause menu of LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean and enter this code, you'll unlock an extra character, very simply called Jack Sparrow. At first it's fairly strange since he appears to look exactly the same, until you actually play as the character and see that he's doing a little jig with some jolly music playing, making all of the characters around him also dance. This game was TT Games' first collaboration with Disney, before the days of Disney owning everything on the frickin' planet including Star Wars and Indiana Jones. TT Games really had fun with this, as at the very end of LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean, you can unlock a level based on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride found at Disney World in Disneyland. It's very simple as you're just defeating the main villains from each film, but the transition from each area is via an on-rails boat simulating the real world attraction. You do have to 100% complete the game to experience it, but it's a cool little reference to the ride which started the entire Pirates of the Caribbean film franchise. <laughs> I'm not sure how true to life the level is to the ride as I've not been on the ride myself, but if I ever find myself in Disneyland I'll be sure to let you know, but at these prices don't hold your frickin breath. Now it seems to be quite a common thing for LEGO games to feature an extra character slash variations of them in certain versions of the game. For example here in LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean there are several extra characters included in the Nintendo DS and 3DS versions of the game that don't feature in the console versions of the game. Most of them are background characters or characters like Greenbeard who I have no recollection of being in the films, however one character who is an important character in the films who doesn't feature in LEGO with Pirates of the Caribbean at all is Captain Teague played by Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. This is a bit weird to be honest as he arguably has an impactful role in two of the films so to leave him out of the game completely is a bit of a head scratcher. There's some speculation that Captain Teague has a somewhat complex role within the Pirate Brethren Court, meaning the developers might have decided to avoid including him to keep the game more accessible for a younger audience. It's a shame all the same, but if they ever do a LEGO remake of all the Pirates of the Caribbean films, hopefully he'll be included alongside Uncle Jack, who was played by another rock and roll legend, Paul McCartney. Jackie boy! How's it going? When LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean released, it coincided with the fourth film in the franchise called On Stranger Tides. The first three films in the saga each had their own tie-in game which I personally have fond memories of playing. However, LEGO The Pirates of the Caribbean ended up being the only video game based on the fourth film. Well, technically On Stranger Tides did have a mobile game, but I didn't realise that until I started editing this video, so anyway. This then led to many fans flocking to LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean to get their booty fix. Pirate booty, come on. There was also a Pirates of the Caribbean game called Armada of the Damned that was meant to be released around this time before getting cancelled, and it's a shame as it looked pretty promising, but hey at least we have Skull and Bones to play instead. In fact scratch that, just play Assassin's Creed 4. 
If you've ever watched Pirates of the Caribbean, you'll be familiar with these noises. They're pretty iconic, and in a match made in heaven, these whelps and screams from Jack Sparrow fit perfectly into the LEGO game formula. The TT games up until this point had no dialogue and relied heavily on grunts and mumbles for comedic effects and to get the story across. Now I couldn't find any hard evidence of this, but apparently Johnny Depp actually recorded the grunts and noises especially for this game. I really hope it's true, and I can imagine it's something he'd actually do as he clearly enjoys playing the character. And if anyone happens to know anything more about this one, feel free to drop it in the comments section, I'd love to have it confirmed. As I mentioned at the start, LEGO first released the Pirates of the Caribbean physical sets alongside the release of this game back in 2011. Turns out though, LEGO already had a Pirates theme 20 years prior which actually bled over into LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean. The LEGO Pirates theme was released in 1989, being inspired by the late golden age of piracy. When LEGO eventually introduced the Pirates of the Caribbean line, they reused some of the original concepts such as the classic swashbuckling pirate minifigure designs along with peg legs, hooks, bandanas, cannons, treasure chests and palm trees. There were of course a lot of differences to match the films, but it's cool that LEGO repurposed and gave new life to the LEGO Pirates theme through the popular Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. Hello mate. Yeah, I got the tickets to Disneyland, yeah. How did I afford it? I sold me kidney. And now for something completely different. LEGO The Lord of the Rings came out back in 2012, and LEGO The Hobbit came out back in 2014. These open world adventure games are based off the beloved books by J.R.R. Tolkien and the film adaptations by Oscar winning director Peter Jackson. The Lord of the Rings films are incredible, universally loved, absolute masterpieces. The Hobbit films are… okay, but LEGO The Hobbit is actually a pretty solid game. One of the reasons why LEGO The Hobbit is so good is because the developers over at TT Games basically just built upon what made LEGO The Lord of the Rings work so well. One of the new features they added was the ability to craft and gather resources throughout Middle-earth. If you've seen or read The Hobbit, you'll know it heavily features dwarves, and these dwarves are known for mining in caves. Here in LEGO The Hobbit then, you can mine for ore, but you can actually find a pretty unique pickaxe to do so with. This here is the Pixel Pickaxe, and it's actually a nod to a little indie game that came out just three years before LEGO The Hobbit. You've probably never heard of it though. It's called Minecraft. I've not really played too much of the game myself, but one of the most iconic things in Minecraft is the pickaxe, so it's pretty clever of the team behind LEGO The Hobbit to include a nod to the now hugely successful game here in Middle-earth. So in LEGO The Hobbit you're able to explore Middle-earth and do quests for people dotted about the place, and there's one quest here in LEGO The Hobbit which may get a chuckle out of Game of Thrones fans. At some point you'll stumble upon this dwarf in the mountains. Mate of mine, we call him John, knows nothing when it comes to snow. He thinks all it's good for is building snowmen and wooing the ladies. His mate John who he mentions is a pretty obvious reference to Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. Wait, hang on, that's not right. This is physician Jon Snow, a leader in the development of anesthesia and medical hygiene. I'm talking about this guy. This is a fun little reference to the famous character from the Game of Thrones TV series, along with one of the show's most quotable lines that put Yorkshire on the map. You know nothing, Jon Snow. Also, if you take a wander into the tombs where the Nazgul's graves can be found, you'll stumble across the actual Iron Throne from Game of Thrones, which is pretty cool. As I mentioned before, you can craft things here in the LEGO Middle-earth games. There's all sorts of things, there's the Yodeling Shield, the Jester's Cane, and even a singing fish blade. These are obviously the more comical ones, but there are very useful ones too. If however, you combine three in particular items together on one character, something pretty funky happens. Equip yourself with the Mithril Dance Boots, then the Mithril Rhythm Stick, and top it all off with the Dazzle Wig, and you'll unlock the achievement Lord of the Prance, which is an awesome little reference to the famous Irish musical Lord of the Dance. Now this next bit isn't essential, but to make this even better, stick on the Carnival Red Brick and you'll turn the entirety of Middle-earth into one big disco with a fat beat playing over the top. One of the elements of LEGO games which I actually kind of ignore are the aforementioned red bricks. They're basically unlockable cheats to make collecting everything in the game a bit easier, but some of them do alter the game in pretty comical ways, one of which is the red brick called Boss Disguises, which ever so slightly transforms all the boss characters in the game. At first I thought these were just random little additions to the bosses, but a few of them are actually pop culture references, such as William, Tom and Bert, the trolls, wearing hats straight out of the 1986 film Three Amigos, or Smaug wearing a deerstalker hat identical to Sherlock Holmes. 
There's also Azog wearing an old school diving helmet which many folks believe to be a reference to the Big Daddies in the Bioshock series. I've actually just realised whilst writing this why Smaug is wearing a Deerstalker hat. It's because Smaug was voiced by Benedict Cumberfluffle in the movies. Do you think flattery will keep you alive? I feel your air. And Benedict also played Sherlock Holmes in the very popular BBC series from a few years ago. This next one is slightly bittersweet to be honest, so the actor Sir Christopher Lee is known for quite a few iconic roles, such as Count Dooku in Star Wars, this guy in 007, Dracula in Dracula, and he was also the lead singer of some heavy metal bands. I'm not joking, listen to this. I was first introduced to him as the Wizard Saruman in the Lord of the Rings trilogy when I was a kid, so as you can imagine I was delighted then to hear his voice in Lego the Hobbit, as he actually narrates the entire game. Strange occurrences have been reported of late, prompting the wizards to investigate. He came in to record the voiceover specifically for this game and gave it such an authentic feel by doing so. Unfortunately though, this would be the last performance Sir Christopher Lee would give as the Dark Wizard Saruman, as he passed away just one year after the game's release at the age of 93, making this game that extra bit special for fans of Middle Earth. Jumping back now to 2012, and we arrive at where the foundations of the Middle Earth games were built, with LEGO The Lord of the Rings. One of the best parts of this game is freely exploring Middle Earth. You can literally walk all the way from the Shire right into Mordor. One does not simply walk into Mordor. On the way though, you'll want to stop at Weathertop, because if you make your way to the summit, you'll find this wooden board protruding out over a small pool of water. If you then proceed to jump in, you'll hear this. That eagle's cry, along with the fact you've just jumped from a great height, is a direct nod to the Assassin's Creed franchise, as a big part of those games is reaching a high place, scanning the area, and jumping off into a bunch of hay or leaves. And pretending like that's enough to prevent you from breaking your spine. It's a really cool little easter egg here in LEGO Lord of the Rings, and it just so happens that a Middle Earth themed game heavily inspired by Assassin's Creed released just two years later called Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor, brilliant game that you should check out if you haven't already. I grew up on these films, and there's one easter egg that always comes to mind when I think of Lord of the Rings, and that's when director Peter Jackson himself made an appearance in each of the three films. Continuing on this cameo tradition, the developers behind LEGO The Lord of the Rings actually added Peter Jackson into their game. He's not a playable character, unfortunately, but in The Fellowship of the Ring, when you arrive at the village of Bree, Peter will be munching away on a carrot, mirroring the film. He's also seen throwing an Oscar during the Battle of Helm's Deep, and once more on this ship in Return of the King. It's a cool little comedic homage to the man who brought Middle Earth to the big screen, spawning plenty of legendary memes. <laughs> Once Aragorn and the Hobbits have fought off the Black Riders on Weathertop, Frodo then needs his fatal wound tended to. Arwen then arrives to rescue Frodo and takes him to her father in the Sanctuary of Rivendell to be healed. This is where we officially meet Lord Elrond, who just about manages to put Frodo back together, but if you glance to the left here, one of the guards seems to stick out like a sore thumb. This is actually Agent Smith from the Matrix films, with the connection being that Hugo Weaving played Lord Elrond in Lord of the Rings, but also Agent Smith in the Matrix films. I found it really cool that in the late 90s and early 2000s, Hugo Weaving had a role in two of cinema's biggest film franchises, and to be honest, they're still hugely impactful films, and this little cameo in Lego The Lord of the Rings is just a great celebration of that. Later on, our heroes find themselves in the minds of Moria in what, for me anyway, is one of the most iconic sequences in cinema history. The Fellowship are escaping from the mines with a Balrog right on their tail, but if you take the time to destroy these silver rocks right here and enter the cave, you'll come across this puzzle which involves figuring out how to play this organ made of bones. At first I thought they just made this up for the game, but it turns out this is a pretty direct recreation of the scene in the classic 1985 film The Goonies where the kids have to figure out how to play this piano made of bones to escape. There's also another little Lord of the Rings connection here, as this kid is Sean Astin, who played Sam in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And while we're here, I might as well point out that this guy right next to him is Josh Brolin, aka Thanos from the MCU. So for any Marvel fans out there, there is your Thanos origin story. You are welcome. This next one I had no idea about, as it's only discoverable on the PlayStation Vita version of the game. At some point during the Two Towers, you'll find Legolas stood upon this rock, and if you speak to him as Aragorn, you'll ask him, Legolas, what do your elf eyes see? In which he replies, and if you keep asking him, he'll keep repeating it. This is a really cool little nod to the famous line that got turned into an oh so beautiful meme many moons ago. Not 
This shows just how in touch the developers are with the fandom surrounding the films and what a good sense of humour they have. There are so many memes of this line from the film, but my favourite has to be this shanty performed by the Dread Crew of Oddwood Band, which I would pay good money to go see live. Jumping forward to the Return of the King, and this is when things ramp up. The Fellowship is scattered and Mordor has unleashed chaos onto Middle-earth. In just one of the many skirmishes playing out across the film, Merry and Eowyn take on the Witch King of Angmar during the battle for Pelennor Fields, but if you jump into this section here in LEGO Lord of the Rings during free play, there's a subtle reference to a very well known video game franchise. Playing as Sam, if you dig up these two herbs you'll notice they're red and green. Combine them together though and you'll make a medkit. Any Resident Evil fans out there will recognise this straight away, as these herbs are a crucial part of staying alive in those games. Not sure why they referenced Resident Evil in LEGO Lord of the Rings, but it's cool all the same. Perhaps they were planning on making a LEGO Resident Evil game, which I still think would be great. A mature rated LEGO game. Not sure how it would work, but yeah, I'd play it. In fact, throw down in the comment section some horror films and games that LEGO could do a weird version of. Sticking with the mature references and easter eggs, around the same time as Merry and Eowyn are battling the Witch King, Sam is infiltrating Sirith Ungol to rescue Frodo once again. I'm just saying, if Sam had the ring and was left to his own devices, he'd be fine, job done, no bother, no drama. But yeah, Frodo had to get involved. For the love of God, get him some shoes. Anyway, in LEGO Lord of the Rings, there's a section where you must then escape the tower, and at some point you'll come across this hidden area which is a really fleshed out recreation of an OG Metal Gear Solid level. I think TT Games are pretty big fans of Metal Gear, as this is just one of many easter eggs they've thrown into their games connected to the franchise. But in LEGO The Lord of the Rings, they went all out, as in this secret area there's searchlights, the marks over guards' heads, and the alarm sound when you're spotted, and you even hide the same way. I love the effort they put into this, and it shows why these LEGO games are so worth playing through to completion, just to stumble across these cool additions. Once you're done in that secret area, you'll then continue on with the level and come across this orc throwing barrels at you, which to me was just normal, but then this banana tree comes into play and that's when I started to kind of question things. Turns out though, both of these things were a cool nod to the Donkey Kong games, with the original coming out all the way back in 1981. In the game, Donkey Kong is launching barrels down to stop the player, which is why the orc is doing it here. When I looked this up, I then saw this easter egg carries on a bit, as there's also this barrel launcher challenge to unlock a mini kit. I've not played the Donkey Kong games myself, but there's apparently barrel launchers in some of those games. So yeah, LEGO The Lord of the Rings isn't just one of my favourite LEGO games down to the license it's covering, it's now also down to just how many cool easter eggs and pop culture references there are scattered throughout this Middle Earth. And now for something completely different. LEGO City Undercover released back in 2013, and it's probably one of my favourite LEGO games, almost purely for its humour. For example, at the beginning of the game, when the main character detective Chase McCain is returning to LEGO City after two years away, he arrives via a cargo ship. Once the passengers disembark, Captain Bluffbeard asks a woman, And what brings you to LEGO City, young lady? In which she replies, Uh, this boat? <laughs> Good one. This is actually a cool little reference to LEGO Island, the first fully fledged LEGO video game from 1997. At the beginning of that game we're introduced to Mama Bricoloni, who's asked in an interview what it was that brought her here to LEGO Island, in which she replies, The boat is silly! A brilliant little throwback to where it all began. So most people know that the LEGO games riff off licensed properties, for example Star Wars, Batman etc, but LEGO City Undercover was one of the rare LEGO games that was completely original and based solely in the world of LEGO. However, the developers still threw in quite a few nods to popular films without directly using the characters or locations. Some examples include the character Barry Smith being a weird blend between Morpheus and Agent Smith from the Matrix films as you fight him in a dojo similar to the training scene from the film. There's also a great one at the beginning of the game as you're arriving into LEGO City on the cargo ship where two lovebirds are reenacting the famous scene from Titanic. My personal favourite though is this guy here, Blue Whitaker. He's a prisoner at Albatross Prison who Chase McCain meets while investigating Rex Fury's escape. He's able to smuggle ridiculous items into the prison, making him a comical take on the character Red, played by Morgan Freeman in the absolutely classic film The Shawshank Redemption. They obviously weren't allowed to use Morgan's real name or likeness in the game, but they got pretty close. Uh, are you free, man? No. No, I am not Freeman. His lawyers might be watching. One of my favourite characters here in LEGO City Undercover is Frank Honey, a 29 year old police officer keen to help Chase McCain settle into LEGO City. At the start of the game, he guides you around the new police station you'll be working at. There's a moment where you need to find a key to get into the chief's office, and whilst you're doing so, 
Frank Honey decides to play some video games on these arcades back here. Most folk probably just continued on with the mission, but if you actually stand and listen to him, you'll realise he's playing a Lego game, making references such as I'm sure they talked more in the movie. Oh, I found one of those special bricks. Free play? But I put like 20 studs in the machine! This is easily missed, but it's well worth a listen since it's such a meta reference. Honey also makes another video game reference whilst he's giving you a tour of the police station. If you keep him waiting for long enough, eventually he'll come out with this. Snake? Snake? SNAKE! This is actually an unmistakable reference to the game over scene from the Metal Gear Solid games. Snake? SNAKE! A little later in the game, you discover Rex Fury's cell. Whilst having a rummage around in typical LEGO fashion, you'll end up building this odd looking drum kit. Turns out though, this isn't just any old drum kit, this is the exact drum kit from the LEGO Rock Band game which the developers of this game, TT Fusion, worked on four years prior. A little bonus fact is that the Rock Band games were actually what got me into playing drums many moons ago. They taught me the basics of how to play which then led me to getting an actual drum kit, and then I ended up getting a university degree in music, so... Yeah, video games can be very useful, Karen. Despite LEGO City Undercover being an original LEGO game, not based off a licensed property, it has a pretty hefty character roster. A lot of the names you probably won't recognise immediately is their original characters made for the game. However, a good few of these minifigures are actually based off the developers of the game, including lead environment artist Ben Mosley, lead action and vehicle designer Luke Cashmore, design supporter Patrick Wenham, lead level designer Ross Wilding, so it's safe to say a lot of the team were featured here in the game. And I love it when creators have a bit of fun and add a bit of themselves into what they're making. So LEGO City Undercover started out as a Nintendo Wii U exclusive back in 2013, but thankfully the game was so good it got ported over to other consoles in 2017. However, there were quite a few tweaks and even removals that had to take place for Nintendo to be willing to let their LEGO love child loose to the rest of the gaming world. In the Wii U release of the game, players were treated to a bunch of easter eggs from the world of Nintendo's pride and joy, the Mario franchise. However, Nintendo being Nintendo, they had all of these easter eggs, references and bonuses removed when porting the game over to other platforms. For example, unless you're playing the Wii U or Switch version of the game, you'll be missing out on cool little Mario references such as the famous flagpole with fireworks going off, the superstar balloon in Festival Square, and catching cheap cheap when you go fishing. I hear Nintendo as a company is pretty strict when it comes to people even talking about their beloved franchises, so the fact I even got away with featuring some Mario footage is a bit of a miracle. And now for something completely different. The developers over at Traveller's Tales kind of have the dream job in terms of making video games, as with each new LEGO game they get to work with a new licensed property and just immerse themselves in that world. I myself have recently just caught up on the Marvel Cinematic Universe and thought it was a fitting time to play through the three mainline LEGO Marvel games. There's LEGO Marvel Super Heroes 1 and 2, then there's the MCU focused LEGO Marvel's Avengers. They're all a joy to play through since they have huge rosters of Marvel characters you can play as, but each game definitely has their pros and cons. Nevertheless, I decided to take a dive into each of them and compile a curated list of cool facts about them, starting with LEGO Marvel Super Heroes which released back in 2013. The first of the LEGO Marvel games is probably the most fondly remembered, at least in terms of pure enjoyment and polish. You can run, drive and fly around as you explore New York City playing as a wide array of beloved Marvel characters, and although it does draw some inspiration from the MCU films, it focuses more on the Marvel comics themselves. Like all LEGO games, there's also a good few easter eggs and nods to popular culture outside of the Marvel Universe, and some did get a chuckle out of me. One pretty early on in the game crops up whilst you're on the SHIELD helicarrier. One of the mini-missions requires you to clear out a load of snakes from the hangar, as a member of SHIELD will pass on this message from Nick Fury. How'd they even get on board? Director Fury told me specifically to get these snakes off this gosh darn helicarrier. I may be paraphrasing slightly. This request is actually a very clever little reference to the ridiculous movie Snakes on a Plane starring Samuel L. Jackson who just so happens to play Nick Fury in the MCU. This genuinely brought a smile to my face as this movie has been wiped from my memory, but now I remember it, it was one of those films I watched as a teenager that I just couldn't get enough of because of how ridiculous it was. There's also another reference to a very different movie here in LEGO Marvel Super Heroes which also involves Samuel L. Jackson on a plane. Human Torch and I will secure the landing zone. I saw this in a movie once. This film that Mr. Fantastic is referring to is Disney Pixar's classic The Incredibles from 2004. In the film, Elastigirl does pretty much the same thing to save her kids when they're shot out of the sky. 
Everything ends well though as Nick Fury is then seen at the end of the game DJing for a party at Avengers Tower, which just so happens to have one last little nod to Samuel Jackson's career. And you will know I am the DJ when I lay my beats down on you. And you will know my name is the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon thee. Speaking of movies, there's a pretty cool achievement which can be unlocked here in LEGO Marvel Super Heroes by doing something fairly simple. If you play as Captain America and then get a friend to hop into co-op mode with you and play as the Human Torch, you'll unlock the achievement Don't I Know You. Now I was lucky enough to grow up with the early 2000s Marvel films and this achievement is a nod to the fact that before Chris Evans played the role of Captain America in the 2011 film, he actually played a different Marvel character before the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe came about. He played the Human Torch in the 2005 Fantastic Four movie. I look back at this film quite fondly and perhaps with rose tinted glasses as they're not amazing now I watch them as an adult but they still played their part in setting the stage for the MCU. I'm actually low key, pun intended, hoping that Chris Evans makes an appearance as the Human Torch during this whole multiverse saga that the MCU is in at the moment. It's pretty unlikely, but yeah, this achievement made me smile when I saw it, but it also kind of reminded me how much I'd love to play just one of these LEGO games all the way through with a second player. But since they're all couch co-op, I can never seem to get someone to play with. Unless... Do you fancy playing a LEGO game in co-op? No. Alright, fair enough. <laughs> This here is a Lego minifigure, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and up until this point these were the only type of figures you could play as in these TT Lego games. However, Lego Marvel Super Heroes was the first game to introduce playable big figs, and I think it's pretty cool how they came about. It wasn't like they were just shoehorned in for the sake of adding something new to the game, they were naturally implemented since the team started this game with the idea of bringing all of the most popular Marvel characters together, and they of course wanted to add in the Hulk. These are challenges because we haven't done what we're calling a big fig before him and other, other characters that like him. That's new for us, but yeah, we're pretty confident that uh, I think as you see, he's gonna look really good. The devs knew that they needed to make the Hulk look bigger than the average size minifig, and so the big fig came into existence. His archetype could then be used for a wide array of other characters, and so the team could really have fun with varying up the character roster with a mix of mini and big figures. These bigger characters would then make an appearance in pretty much every TT LEGO game going forward, and we kind of have the Hulk to thank for it. Technically speaking, the first physical big fig apparently dates back to 1999 with this rock monster, but the Hulk is just a lot cooler and was the first big fig to be playable in a video game. And with that, I was finished up with LEGO Marvel Super Heroes. I really enjoyed exploring New York's open world and just chilling with all the characters, some of which admittedly I had no idea who they were, but I can't deny I was probably more excited to play TT Games next LEGO Marvel game as it focuses much more on the Marvel Cinematic Universe itself. So before TT Games decided to make a sequel to LEGO Marvel Super Heroes, they actually aimed their sights at the very popular Marvel Cinematic Universe and felt like making a spin-off game of sorts in the form of LEGO Marvel's Avengers, released in 2016. It comically recreates the events that unfold in the first two Avengers films, similar to how the earlier LEGO games recreated the LEGO Star Wars films. However, there are an array of fun side quests you can do throughout the game, and there's one or two worth mentioning as they have pretty cool backstories. For example, once again, when you're on the helicarrier, you'll come across this side mission called Blueberry Blues, where a S.H.I.E.L.D. employee will ask for your help cleaning up after Tony Stark since he's left a load of blueberries all over the place. Last time he was here, he was snacking on blueberries, ended up dropping more on the floor and into our machinery than in his mouth. To those unaware, this is probably just a fairly bizarre quest dreamt up by the devs, but it's actually a funny little nod to when the first Avengers film was being filmed, and Robert Downey Jr, who plays Tony Stark, randomly brought a bunch of blueberries on set and started eating them while filming. Apparently he kept snacks hidden around the set for when he got hungry, and none of his cast members knew he was going to suddenly start snacking whilst filming, so when he then proceeded to offer them something during the scene, that's their genuine baffled reaction. In a few hours I'll know every dirty secret shield has ever tried to hide blueberry. Another funny poke at the Avengers films is the inclusion of a string of side quests where the Hulk has to take selfies, so apparently these were thrown in as a drawn out joke made about one of the film trailers for Avengers Age of Ultron. In one of those trailers we get a glimpse of this pretty memorable shot where the Avengers all dramatically dive into battle. Well apparently at the time, a lot of jokes were being made due to the fact that the Hulk looks like he's taking a selfie with the rest of the crew. This apparently then spawned the inclusion of these Hulk selfie missions here in LEGO The Avengers. Whether it's an extension of this joke or not I don't know, but there's also a Hulk selfie scene in Avengers Endgame, so maybe this is all a really long winded joke at the Hulk's love for selfies. I don't really know. I hope it is though. 
Now I could have slotted this into the previous section, but felt it warranted its own chapter, as me and Bianca really enjoyed the Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. TV show, and I was so happy that it got a fairly hefty inclusion here in LEGO Marvel's Avengers. The fact that Clark Gregg actually reprises his role as Phil Coulson for the game is cool in and of itself, but the developers also threw in a handful of funny nods dedicated to the long-standing hero of S.H.I.E.L.D. First off there's the scene in which Coulson technically dies in the first Avengers film, but just before we seemingly see the last of him, Nick Fury proceeds to place something on his body. This ticket to Tahiti is a funny hint at what happens to Coulson after the Avengers film, in which he is actually brought back to life in a magical place called Tahiti, which kicks off the first season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. You should go sometime. Where? Tahiti. It's a magical place. Plus, if you actually play as Phil Coulson and drive his car Lola, you'll unlock the achievement A Funny Thing Happened. But if you happen to crash and end up dying, don't worry because you'll then respawn and actually unlock another achievement called A Magical Place. I'm just really glad that my boy Phil and the rest of his team got slotted into the game, and all I'm saying is I personally would love to play a LEGO Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. game, and I'm pretty sure Bianca would too. In fact, what if it was a LEGO Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. game? Maybe, but not now. God damn it! As most folk are aware, LEGO is very popular. Not only in the digital world of video games, but also in the physical realm. People enjoy collecting these bricks, and when I say collect, like, when the world ends, I wouldn't be surprised if this stuff becomes a freaking currency. Well if that does happen, keep an eye out for one of these on the black market, because this here is an exclusive transparent trophy brick. These awards in a sense have been gifted to the development team of TT LEGO games dating all the way back to 2008's LEGO Batman the video game. As you can see this one in particular is from LEGO Marvel's Avengers, with the game's title printed on it along with the employee's choice of minifig housed inside. I love the fact that they appear to be stackable too, so if a developer worked on multiple TT LEGO games, they may have two or three of these exclusive trophies stacked on top of one another, displayed somewhere ready for me to steal. I mean, admire. Somehow this guy on YouTube going by the name of Mini Superheroes Today got hold of one, which is where I found out about this, and he does a cool little video talking more about the trophy, so definitely go check him out if this sort of thing interests you at all. I myself have only ever built one LEGO set, and it was quite recently actually, and for me it's kind of like a trophy, something special that I think I'll always be proud of. And I keep it for safekeeping just over there. Okay, we'll get it later. Overall, I enjoyed LEGO Marvel's Avengers because I enjoyed the MCU, but is it great when compared to other LEGO games? It's okay. And with that, we swing forward to the official sequel to LEGO Marvel Super Heroes, and for better or worse, just like the multiverse saga in the MCU, this game definitely embraced the weirder side of Marvel. Although technically a sequel to the original game four years prior, it feels subpar in a handful of ways. It still has its merits, don't get me wrong, like the gameplay is still as fun as ever, and there's a nice mix of elements from the MCU and Marvel comics, but there's just something lacking, which I'll get to soon. Like the previous two games though, there's still a couple of fun references and easter eggs I thought were worth mentioning. For example, towards the beginning of the game, I let out a slight chuckle when Captain Marvel comes out with this line at the Avengers Mansion. The Brie is fantastic. Could you pass me some more nachos? Which is a cheesy little joke referencing Brie Larson who plays Captain Marvel in the MCU. However, the main one I remember happens whilst wandering the streets of Chronopolis, which is the place created outside of time and cut off from all other realities formed by the game's villain, Kang the Conqueror. This acts as the open world stage for the player to explore, so there's all sorts of environments all mixed into one, but at some point you'll hear Kang announce this over the speakers. One lucky citizen can win themselves a tour of my citadel by finding the elusive golden ticket hidden inside the wrapper of a regular delicious Kang bar. Any fans of Roald Dahl's 1964 novel Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or any of the film adaptations will probably smile at this reference instantly, as Kang is essentially parodying the events which take place at the beginning of that book, where Willy Wonka gives five lucky children the chance to visit his chocolate factory. I do wonder if the developers choose these references at random or if they have some deeper connection to the game, but either way, once I inevitably move on from playing these LEGO games, I'll no doubt miss uncovering the sheer amount of pop culture references that Traveller's Tales slot into these LEGO games. As I mentioned, this game for me felt a little lacking, compared to the first game anyway. Don't get me wrong, I still enjoyed it, and it features the Guardians of the Galaxy, who are probably my favourite characters in Marvel, but there's actually a good bunch of Marvel characters missing from this game who did feature in the first one. At first I thought it was maybe just due to the direction of the story, but it turns out LEGO Marvel Super Heroes 2 couldn't legally feature mainline characters from the first game, including the Fantastic Four and the X-Men. 
At the time of the game's development, 20th Century Fox held the film rights to these characters, and there were restrictions on their use in other media, so TT Games just didn't have the legal rights to use them at the time. The in-game explanation for their absence is that Kang the Conqueror only transported a section of New York to Chronopolis, leaving the X-Men and Fantastic Four behind in the remaining part of New York back on Earth. The game very vaguely alludes to these absent characters, and also mentions them in some character card bios, but otherwise they're nowhere to be seen. I felt that Wolverine and the rest of the X-Men brought a nice bit of variety to the first game, and their absence truly was felt here in the sequel. The game does have a bit of fun with this though, as there's one scene in particular where an Asgardian cooking show takes a bit of a jab at how convoluted these licensing and copyright laws are surrounding Marvel. Although we can't allude to it, we can't show you the apron or the website for legal reasons, as our rivals on the broadcast rights to it. Is all Midgardian law so contrived? Mainly copyright law. Since this game's release though, Disney's acquisition of 20th Century Fox in 2019 means the rights to the X-Men and Fantastic Four characters have now reverted to Marvel, meaning they could now potentially be included in future LEGO Marvel games, which is very cool. Why would Disney want this particular deal to go through? Hello! I like money! As if the whole licensing malarkey wasn't enough, there's actually another factor which took away some of the charm that the first game had. Jesus, I should really call this video depressing facts about LEGO Marvel games. Anyway, this game's development was affected by the video game voice actor strike, which took place between 2016 and 2017. This meant the cast from the previous LEGO Marvel games didn't return to reprise their roles, as they were affiliated with the Screen Actors Guild and American Federation of Television and Radio Arts. This means that pretty much all of the characters here in LEGO Marvel Super Heroes 2 don't have the same voices players were familiar with from the first game, and sadly, you can kind of feel it. Where exactly are you sending me on my date with Thor? A research vessel covered with weapons. Well, that's deceptive labeling. Don't tell me. You got here on a really long spider line. Electromagnetic pulse. Set that baby off, we bring down the Citadel shields. We've conducted analysis on the Nexus shards. The answer's simple. We create a channeling device to raise the footprint high above the mansion. The characters don't quite have the same charm and distinctiveness that they did in the first game, and that's not to say they're badly voice acted. The change-ups just naturally made the characters feel different from the first game. It's okay for one or two characters, but when pretty much everyone sounds different, it's kind of hard to see these as the same characters from the first game, for me anyway. I'm sure a lot of folks don't care about this kind of thing, but I thought it was interesting enough to mention nevertheless. That being said, I very much enjoyed checking out all of the LEGO Marvel games and seeing them evolve over time, especially in their visuals and gameplay, and you can be sure I'll be diving in to check out any new entries later down the line. Alright, I'm not angry anymore, do you want to play co-op? And now for something completely different. LEGO Jurassic World came out back in 2015, based off the four Jurassic Park films that were released at the time. The first film is considered the best, absolute classic, with the following films being a bit of a mixed bag. <laughs> Regardless though, the developers over at Traveller's Tales actually managed to make a brilliant game from all four films. Like all the previous LEGO games before it, this game features plenty of pop culture references. In LEGO Jurassic World, the team paid homage to the legendary director behind the very first Jurassic Park film, Steven Spielberg. They did this by throwing in a handful of nods to other brilliant films he'd made up until this point. For example, in the Lost World section of the game, hunters have come to capture dinosaurs and take them off the island. Get into the outrigger, you're closing in on her. The one with the big red horn, the Pompadour! We're then shown their camp, where they keep the dinos in cages, but just before we do, there's this shot here which shows someone on a flying bike soaring through the night sky. This is obviously a reference to Spielberg's beloved film E.T., which I've never actually watched, can you believe? Another example comes at the end of The Lost World, where the famous scene from Jaws is recreated when a man witnesses a T-Rex escaping from a cargo ship. <laughs> gonna need a bigger boat. You're gonna need a bigger boat. Is it cold outside? Yes, it is. I'm gonna need a bigger coat. I had no idea Spielberg directed that film to be honest, but I did know he directed Indiana Jones, which of course got a couple of little nods here too with this scene here. And also the fact Indiana's whip and hat can be seen on display right here in this shop. Really clever little nods to a very talented filmmaker, if you just forget the time when he made this. But other than that, it's a legend. 
So it's quite common for LEGO games to feature real world focused playable characters, and LEGO Jurassic World is no different. Steven Spielberg is actually a playable character here, for example. He even has a brilliant ability where he throws Oscar awards since the guy has won a hefty few in his time, and he can be seen filming here in this cutscene from The Lost World. It could be completed and ready to receive visitors in less than a month. The cameos don't stop there though, as you can also play as Jurassic World director Colin Trevorrow and producers Pat Crowley and Frank Marshall. For some reason though, Jurassic Park 3 director Joe Johnston isn't featured in the game. Now I know that film isn't exactly highly rated, but I actually like it. It's not one of the best, but it's a damn sight better than those last two Jurassic World films called, um... What were those last two films called? What were they called? What was the name of those last two Jurassic World films? I don't know. Who cares? Exactly! Speaking of Jurassic Park 3, here in LEGO Jurassic World there's actually a pretty cool moment which is based off a deleted scene from the film. Now apparently in an early draft of Jurassic Park 3's script, there was going to be a fight between some Velociraptors and an Ankylosaurus. The scene likely would have taken place around the same time Eric saves Dr. Alan Grant from a bunch of Velociraptors. But alas, it never came to be. However, TT Games decided to have a little fun with this lost scene by featuring an injured Ankylosaurus here in one of the game's levels, around the same time and place the fight was planned to happen in the film. You have to help this poor dino back onto its feet after it's been injured, which we can speculate happened during its fight with the Velociraptors. So even though this poor guy didn't make it into the film, he did get his 5 minutes of fame here in LEGO Jurassic World. Ankylosaurus. 10 out of 10 meme. So by the time this game came out, the LEGO games were pretty set with their approach to dialogue in their games. In the early days they would have characters mumbling, <laughs> then they introduced fully voice actor dialogue, this is my award. Billy, Billy, me. <laughs> Whoa, you, just, you, just, you just stuck that on there! And then they experimented with using dialogue straight from the source material. We should leave now. No. Hawks patrol the eastern shore. We must wait for cover of darkness. But here in this game, they kind of blended it all together, as the dialogue from the first three sections of the game are pretty much entirely pulled from the movies, but then when it came to Jurassic World, most of the actual voice actors from the film came in to voice their characters, including Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard. Indominus Rex? What's this thing made of? I'll be honest and say there's a slight element of nostalgia here which made this worth mentioning. It reminds me of the days when movie tie-in games such as The Lord of the Rings The Return of the King would have the actors come in to do the voiceover for their character and even play the game whilst it was being developed. Gandalf is 7,000 years old but he can do the most remarkable things and uh, he's still got a, a spring in his step. And I only wish that Gandalf in the film had been quite as agile as, as Gandalf in the game. I just loved how these behind the scenes interviews and developer diaries were unlockables within the game itself and they should bring that kind of stuff back, even though nowadays you'd probably have to buy the super deluxe kiss my ass give me money edition for stuff like that. I miss gaming in the early 2000s. As I mentioned earlier, LEGO Jurassic World references a lot of Steven Spielberg's previous films, but there's another franchise here that gets multiple references, and that's Back to the Future. I've still not watched these films actually, but apparently TT Games have, as there's multiple nods to the beloved films here. You turn the time circuits on! <laughs> This readout tells you where you're going, this one tells you where you are, this one tells you where you were. You input your destination time on this keypad. For example, here you can see the DeLorean being dug up near the beginning of the game, and you'll also find Marty himself hiding from a dinosaur towards the end of the game. But what's really interesting is that the famous time travelling car itself is actually a drivable vehicle here in the game. It takes some tinkering with in the game's files as apparently it's hidden away pretty well, but yeah, I stumbled across this guy's video on YouTube where he got it working. I'm guessing they threw all these references in as teasers for their following game LEGO Dimensions as I believe they're playable characters in the game, but I've not played it myself so maybe someone in the comments section can shed some more light on why Back to the Future is featured quite heavily here in LEGO Jurassic World. So most of Traveller's Tales earlier LEGO games would include a trailer for their next game. For example, in LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga, there was a trailer for their next game LEGO Indiana Jones. However, a bit later down the road, they opted for a more subtle approach as LEGO Jurassic World wasn't officially announced with a trailer, but instead merely hinted at. 
During LEGO Batman 3's end credits, we see Batman and Robin scaling a building, and at some point, this happens. I just can't seem to get a break today. In hindsight, it's a very clear reference to Jurassic Park being their next game, but at the time, it left a lot of room for speculation amongst fans as to whether that would be TT Games' next release or just another random reference to a popular film. This trend continued as LEGO Jurassic World also featured a teaser in this post credit scene. I had no idea what this was hinting at, but it turns out it was for LEGO Dimensions, which released just a few months later that very same year. And that's about it. Cheers for watching. As always, it's appreciated. And if you'd like to see some more cool facts about video games that I'm playing at the minute, you can check out this playlist right here. And I will see you on the next one. I'm filming now, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> I need to get myself a straight face first. <laughs> <laughs> no, make me laugh before, okay. before, please. Okay. And I keep it for safekeeping just over there. Okay, we can play it. <laughs> that was fing perfect. Okay, so a bit more practicing. Okay. Hootini! Hootini! <laughs> okay, a couple more. Hootini! 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 <laughs> That'll do. <laughs>